Welcome to a tech moment on Cannabis Tech. I'm your host, Christina Etter. In this podcast, we take just a few minutes to talk about some of the exciting science and technology that's impacting and changing the cannabis and hemp industries. Now, I have a little bit of a confession. Before I became a part of the legal cannabis space, I was just like everyone else out there, and I was buying from the legacy market. Now, Back then, we were completely oblivious to these things that we might be inhaling into our lungs, one of the most sensitive organs in our bodies. But then I started working in the cannabis space and I started writing about the cannabis industry and I learned. And friends, let me tell you, once you have seen behind that curtain, you cannot unsee what you have seen. And that's why here at Cannabis Tech, we love to focus on clean, ethical cannabis production in the cannabis space. Now, last month, we invited Ellis Smith onto the show from American Cannabis Consulting to talk about the importance of an integrated pest management system or IPM program. And we brought Ron Romano from SafetyNet on to talk about the technologies that can be used to help ensure those clean facilities and a contaminant free growing environment. So in today's podcast, we're going to continue to expand on that topic a little bit because we know that biosecurity is one of the most critical parts of an ethical cannabis operation. Now, a cannabis grow facility is just naturally susceptible to pests. And by pests, we're talking about all kinds of pests. We're talking about the bugs that can infect the plants. We're talking about molds that can occur during the drying and curing processes or even within the facility them themselves. There are viruses, bacteria, and fungus that can wreak havoc on these facilities. Now, if you haven't already seen it, last week we published an article that kind of ran through some of these potential hazards, potential threats that are in a facility. Now, regardless of the size of the operation, being aware of the contaminants that you have in your facility should be priority number one. So for today's podcast, we're going to take a little more of an educated approach to decontamination and remediation in a cannabis facility. And that's gonna start with Pathogen DX and their CEO, Milan Patel, to talk about how we can figure out just exactly what are the hazards that we're dealing with in these grow facilities. So Millen, thanks so much for taking the time out of your day today to join us for the show and talk about some of these pathogens that are being found in cannabis grow facilities. Hi, Christina. Um, thanks for having me on this podcast. It's, it's great to be back here, specifically talking about pathogens as well. It, it seems like it's becoming almost a cliche uh, and synonymous with the cannabis and hemp industry. So, yeah, um, uh, you know, we've been in the business for about seven, eight years now in 2014, specifically focused on uh, helping the industry, I, you know, uh, reduce the incidence of pathogens, which is bacterial and fungal organisms, uh, both in the regulated products, which is both the flower and the non-flower matrices. Um, we supply testing kits and equipment to over 120 testing labs across 36 different states. Um, and now specifically, when you look at the incidences of uh, the, the bugs that kill you, can hurt you, harm you, um, whether the cannabis is used for medical or, or adult or recreational use, uh, there is a, there's about a half a dozen cast of characters that are dangerous, right? The, the, the classic ones, we all know that, that they, they don't escape from cannabis, uh, just like they haven't been able to escape in the food world or the agricultural world. And that's the, the E. coli, the salmonella. These are the pathogenic, pathogenic ver versions. What's unique to, um, um, cannabis is, uh, uh, fungal organisms, if, especially since there's inhalation of flour, uh, specifically, uh, uh, you know, or even oils to that degree. They are the Aspergillus species, the family. There's the Flavus fumigatus niger and terius. And these are all, you know, have had known clinical cases, meaning when you look, when you rewind the clock and you look back in time, was a patient you know, brought into a hospital, you know, with a known case of aspergillosis, salmonellosis, you know, some kind of sickness and, you know, you know, injury or death. And that's where the beginning of times, uh, you know, happens. These are the classic six. 
There's, you know, um, Listeria, there's Pseudomonas. If you have Pseudomonas, you know, and we've heard of MRSA in terms of methicillin resistant Staph aureus infections, you can have that. So there's another bunch of, you know, three or four that are, uh, you know, that could show up over the course of time. But the six that I mentioned, now in the case of the grow, the, the cultivation, that's where everything starts, right? So we've seen up to two dozen organisms in the growth facility, primarily because what we're dealing with is the perfect combination of humidity, temperature, light, and, and air or water, moisture, all coming together to create the perfect environment for, for bugs vis-a-vis bacterial and fungal organisms to grow in, the, in, in, in a cultivation facility. Such things as mucor, candida albicans, you know, alternaria, I'm just spouting off a lot, you know, powdery mildew, botrytis. These are, these are regular everyday bugs that are start, you know, that are cropping up within the cultivation facility, even though they're not quote, quote unquote human health pathogens, meaning they're not regulated for testing on the actual end product. If you may, they still show up in the cultivation facility. And so, those th- those are what we're dealing with, and that you know they stack up to about a, a dozen to at most uh, two dozen that can create issues in terms of the end quality of the product. You know, hope I hope I wasn't overly uh, verbose, but I, I and I was able to answer your question. No, I, I love all the detail that you gave there, and you know one of the things that I want to kind of touch on, and, and you touched on this briefly, is that. Before the legal industry and and when stigmas were so um, intense, I think a lot of people didn't mention to their doctors, oh, by the way, I smoke cannabis or, oh, by the way, I've I've been smoking marijuana. So you're right. I think when people have in the past might have gone in for some of these different infections or lung issues or things that they've had, I, I, I question whether or not that information ever really got tied back to cannabis use. And so now that we're seeing these things and people talking more about their cannabis use and, and being more open about it in terms of their health and, and what they're, or why they're consuming cannabis, I guess. Um, I I think we're going to see more of this, especially in those, you know, in these cases where people are using cannabis for medical purposes, the last thing they want to do is inhale something that's ultimately going to make them sicker in the long run. And, you know, so I, I'm, I'm really anxious to kind of dive into how do you test for some of these things? What are some of the tests that you offer at Pathogen to let cannabis growers know that there's potential for these hazards within their facility? Because, I mean, I think long term, this could potentially, you know, turn into legal issues for the cannabis space, you know, uh, as, as people start to bring these cases forward. Yeah, um, great, great, great questions. Part one of that question is, what do you test? You know, you, you want you want to test for all of the pathogenic bacterial and fungal. We, we offer both regulated test kits as well as non-regulated test kits. And what that means is the regulated test kits that cover all the legal jurisdicted markets for, um, you know, these the, the big six, we call it E. coli, Steck E. coli 1 and 2 back Salmonella and the four Aspergillus species. In some cases, uh, certain states have asked for Staph aureus and Listeria and, and you know, um, those types of bugs, Clostridium, Botulism. So these are, these are tests that are saying, is this species in this, in this product? Then there are, there are tests that are required for how much, uh, how much bacteria is there, such as total aerobic bacteria, total coliform, bile targum grag negative, and, and total yeast and mold. And so these are ones that give you a count of how much there are in that sample. And the, 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 the false premise is, is certain jurisdictions didn't really add aspergillus. Like, for example, Colorado, Colorado just added it in 2022. Think about that for a second. Everybody that's consumed it from the time it was legalized they, the one that was in that was regulated was total yeast and mold. But if you if you don't know, it, you know, there's a certain allowable uh, cannabis consumption for whether it's a thousand CFUs per gram or ten thousand CFUs per gram. 
Imagine the concept of saying I'm smoking cannabis with a certain amount of yeast and mold allowable that's going into your lungs, but we don't really know the makeup of that yeast and mold. Now, if the makeup of that yeast and mold has aspergillus and that jurisdiction is not te testing for it, then you're introducing a very pathogenic organism into your body that would result in potentially in the future could result in potential illegal issues, if you may, right? So the, the point around all of this is, is that, you know, when we're talking about cannabis consumption from a medical grade perspective, let's put ourselves out there in terms of the horizon. When you're looking at calling something medical grade, you're saying it's help you, helping you from a health state and safety perspective. Under an F FDA umbrella, you would need to have a model where you have to have the appropriate quality management systems and continuous good manufacturing processes within a cultivation facility to say that I am growing medical grade product in compliance to not having it. It has to be absolutely sterile, just like the pharma industry is, has to have sterility tests on drugs to make sure there's nothing else on that drug that's a microbe before you and I consuming. It's where the industry will ultimately wind up under a federal model. And that's why not only are we needing to test those specific organisms, you know, that are pathogenic, but it has to be free of everything else. Even if I say, guess what? Dolomite, you know, my powdery mildew is not being regulated, but it exists in the grow, but suddenly powdery mildew is on the product. That would be unallowable at the federal model because it's still being used for medical grade. And nobody has proven to the FDA or anybody that powdery mildew on, on weed is, is harmful or helpful. So if you can't prove it, they're going to not want it on the product. So even by incidence, if those other bugs that wind, that are in a grow wind up on the product and it's not regulated, it is still a problem. See if you get my point. Absolutely. 100%. You know, and I'll, I, I have a little story to kind of go along with this that I use a lot to explain this to people. Um, and, and I'm glad that you brought in the FDA regulation because obviously we know that we're moving towards federal regulation. We're moving towards federal legalization or at least decriminalization at some point. And, and so these things are going to become more and more critical, I think, as the industry grows. But I love to make cinnamon rolls and I make cinnamon rolls with a really fluffy cream cheese frosting. And I know that here in the state of Colorado, I cannot sell those cinnamon rolls and make a profit from them because of the fact that the frosting is made with cheese and therefore cheese can introduce foodborne pathogens. And I have to be um, permitted and have a commercial kitchen and have it inspected on a regular basis for me to be able to legally sell those cinnamon rolls. Because the last thing that the state wants is for me to use, you know, maybe cream cheese that's been out of date for a while or something like that and, and introduce an opportunity for illness in the consumer that is paying money for the product that I make. It's no different in the cannabis space. If you're making a profit off of a product that people are consuming, you have to be able to prove that that product is safe and clean for the consumer to, to take into their body. And so there's, you know, there's regulations in every industry where there's a consumer that is, is, consuming this product, you know, into their bodies. And, and so I, I, the cannabis space just cannot be any different. You know, we, we have to ensure that consumers have those kinds of safeguards in place. Um, now with this conversation and, and with the previous podcast that we did, one of the things that we're doing is we kind of got this little side project case study and Millen, I would love to have you kind of touch base on what exactly did Pathogen do at this facility last week in terms of testing? And, and uh, what, what's kind of that process, I guess, for inviting your company in and doing the tests that are required for, you know, understanding what's there in the facility? Yeah, absolutely. Great question. And thank you for bringing that up. That was an, ex that was an incredible opportunity to go, go into Pacific Grower um, and we appreciate that opportunity. We have a unique product called EnviroX that can identify roughly around 40, 40 I think 40 plus uh, um, bacterial and fungal organisms. Now, the, the curation was, that was done re related to this product called EnviroX is that it's a simple swab. It's basically a swab that you swab on surfaces and you collect 
you know, uh, basically whatever is on the surface into a, uh, a, a trans transport media, basically a liquid that you put into a test tube. And whatever you collect, it winds up in that liquid. And so essentially, um, you know, what you're trying to identify is what is really resident on that surface in terms of a pathogen, whether bacterial, fungal. And what we've done is over the last several years since we first formed the company is we've, we've tried to push this initiative of doing what is called environmental monitoring within the cultivation world, within the cannabis sector. We fundamentally believe that every cultivation cultivator should be doing environmental monitoring to really identify the hotspots in their production facility or the cultivation facility, you know, and the grow facility where the re, where pathogens occur. Where do they grow? Where do they regrow based upon us, you know, their normal cycle of, 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 uh, uh, producing the product. Okay. And so. What we did was we basically swabbed roughly, I think, close to around 40 locations before an application on uh, that was applied in terms of remediation by safety net. And we were able to identify real issues, okay? Where was their total aerobic bacteria? Where was their pseudomonas? Where was, the, we found salmonella in key locations. In fact, within the specific grow, we identified powdery mildew. We identified powdery mildew on one of the cell phones of one of the employees. So there's a there's a basically a, a tr transfer of these bugs. We found specifically organisms on the door handles of a door. So you know we can get into the specifics, but the idea behind this is when you're looking at growing product, and it's very difficult. We understand that it's not easy when you're dealing with. The four elements we talked about regarding the environmental elements. How do you keep those in control over the course of a growth cycle? Well, you you try your best, but if you don't environment environmentally monitor and identify what bugs are growing where and they're reoccurring at those locations, you won't really know those hot zones and how to deal with those from a quality management system perspective. And so we identified things such as uh, powdery mildew across the entire grow. It was basically occurring within their HVAC system and their exhaust fan was blowing it in out into certain areas. We identified salmonella specifically on the mother plant. And that was even a problem. Yes. So there was a shocking look. But if it comes from the mother plant, what we're saying is we're perpetuating the, the, that to every other plant. And so... You know, this is not necessarily what you want to hear as a grow, but that we're appreciative of this opportunity primarily because we want to help the industry solve this problem. And the ideal way to do it is this is not an expensive test. It's one, one swab that covers 40 different bugs at different locations. But if you do it on a regular basis, companies like Safety Net can come in and help them address that from a corrective action perspective. We can help in terms of how we, you know, what did you, what was the bug you identified? Where was it? You know, how much was it? Right. And, and then if you do it regularly, just like Christina, you clean your house, I clean my house. Imagine we didn't clean our house once a quarter or two, you know, just twice a year. What would we see? We would see mold growing in corners. We would see bacteria growing elsewhere. And if we are living in a humid, in humid state, then it makes it even worse. You see. And Mylon, you make some very good points here. You know, you were talking about, you know, initially, you know, all the pathogens, what ultimately can result on the plants themselves. And what we've found is in our time in the cannabis industry and what we have, um, you know, found talking to different grow houses and so forth, you know, the emphasis has always been on the end plant you know, making sure that plant is healthy, no pathogens and all of that, which we understand that is the end product. Uh, but although they're aware of, you know, all the different things that can contribute to what goes on those plants, again, the hard surfaces, the air, the water, everything you spoke about, uh, but yet there has been no action towards, you know, dealing with that. It's always been a reactive approach once they know the plants are infected. So it's great to hear that what you guys do from an environmental standpoint, you know, touches on the things that are really most important 
up front. Deal with the issues before they become bigger issues in the end. Yeah, thanks for bringing that point up, Jim. It, it's a causal relationship between what's in the environment and what winds up in the plant when we do the when our labs do the regulated testing. And so, what what perpetuates is remember the word of lab test lab shopping, right? We've heard about that in the in the on the compliance side of regulated product testing. Growers that aren't happy will go to another lab that will give them the answer that they want. So essentially, when you when 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 a when a grower is not happy with the result from a lab that has a failed product for microbes or pathogens, they'll look for a lab that is using a less sensitive method, basically to a large degree. So that association between the plant tested or the, the plant, the, 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 the product that's, t- that's tested in a compliance testing lab on the actual plant, there's, there's a relationship from the environment that you're speaking regarding how, in, if you're monitoring that environment, I fundamentally believe, and I think you two, you two do, that if you're monitoring, regular, mon- regularly monitoring that environment, then, and we're able to remediate and, uh, that environment, the incidence of failed product winding on the actual plant itself that goes to a cannabis testing lab for compliance testing, regulated testing, will drop in terms of failed samples. It's just, it's just, you know, it's, it's sort of, it's sort of, I want to say common sense, but it's actually, that's how things work. A dirty environment will create dirty product. Dirty product will fail. You, you'll have unhappy customers. Clean product, clean environment will result in clean product. Clean product will result in less failures, more past product, happy customers. You know, that's my thing. 100%. 100%. Plus, I would assume that if you're going through the process of of making sure that the plant has the best environment to grow in, I would assume that this is eventually going to impact your quality. It's going to impact your quantity because obviously your plants are going to be healthier. They're not going to be fighting off some of these these um, uh, contaminants and and working to to protect themselves so they can actually invest more energy in growing and producing a good quality um, crop. Um, but before we dive into the next you know kind of segment of this podcast, Millen, will you touch base for me? I, I understand that you also help growers track these results and be able to kind of pick up on maybe some patterns that are happening in the facility that can help kind of um, address what might be happening. So for example, uh, you talked about the um, powdery mildew that was on someone's phone that was coming into the grow. I think after time with your tests, the growers are going to start to see where some of these, I want to call them leakages are happening. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. That is correct. And I think that you know, it's it's a it's a the classic word of a, having a standard operating practice in place. The, my component and my my part of the equation on where we help is specifically, um, you know, working with the growers, and we've done this, you know, um, at least for three to four dozen growers in in communicating, you know, I helping them identify where the where the hot zones are. The, you know, over the course of their growth cycle, right? And it's not a daily thing. The, the idea is to identify, what, you know, where where are these bugs happening? What should be the frequency of environmental monitoring? In, in other words, testing for these. Then we'll and what are the what's the composition of those bugs, the, the bacterial and fungal organisms within the growth facility? Where do they reoccur? It, it, then the growth grow cultivation facility. Our narrative has been. What was the humidity conditions? What was the temperature conditions? What was the lighting conditions? What were the moisture conditions? And what were the airflow conditions? Those five things play a lot in perpetuating the, the spores from, you know, basically redepositing in not just the same areas, but other areas. So that I, the, I, that's the approach that we've taken, you know, on that front in terms of where, you know, what's happening with respect to the pathogen profile within the growth facility relative to these, the environmental elements that I just brought up. And that communication has, we've had time and time and time over again in helping them. And to a large degree, I would, you know, say that unfortunately we haven't been as successful as we should have. And we need to have a different, you know, conversation around this with the growing community 
that this is where it matters for you before we fall off the cliff edge when it finally hits the federal model. Because when we do get to the federal model, God bless us all because it's a different world there. And they will, they will reach through not just to, for example, the grow. Where did the grow facility, where is it getting, is it testing its water? Is it testing its soil? Is it testing its growth material? Okay. Is it testing its air? Is it, te is it testing the surfaces? So we, it'll become even more draconian if we don't start baby step now, right? We crawl to it, we baby step, we walk to it, and then we run to it as an industry. And if we have to do this, this is what we need. And that's our, that's been my, you know, philosophy behind working with the growers in that type of approach. The technology is here now. We can develop an SOP. We have companies like Safety Net that can come and address, address this issue, but we need the, the help from the growing community to do their part in accepting that that's what the world needs to be for clean, safe product that actually gets into the consumer's hand. Otherwise, it goes back to your very first question on the legal reach back, because at some point, when it finally comes through, the FDA may not care and say, guess what? Where's your records on environmental monitoring and remediation back in 2018? We don't have it. Guess what? You're closing shop. Yep. And Marlon, you again make, make some really good points here because, again, we keep up with the conversations that are obviously going on in the cannabis industry today. We see it's advertised. We see the news stories about lab testing, lawsuits that are happening, um, you know, the dispensaries that are being shut down for contaminated products, so on and so forth. Um, so the industry knows what's going on, and you're correct uh, that, you know, they realize that if something doesn't happen soon, um, these issues are going to keep growing. And again, it comes right back to, um, you know, all of these issues, the lab testing, the things that, you know, are happening to put out you know, erroneous numbers. Again, the consumers are becoming more aware uh, because of these conversations about you know, contaminated product and therefore now they're going to come forward and start questioning things a lot more. So, you know, as Ellis pointed out in the first webcast, you know, everybody is taking a reactive approach today, but using products like yours for testing, things that safety net brings to the table, uh, allowing us to address um, the underlying issues that will result in better product, you know, I think that's going to turn everything completely around and, and it help it before it gets way out of control. Fantastic. And Jim, you know, you bring up a good point there. And, and one of the things that I really wanted to stress, particularly in this podcast, and, and I kind of started out with this in the introduction, is that there's a learning curve. You know, I, I think we're all kind of learning as we go. We talk so much about how much the consumer needs to be educated, but I think in terms of commercial production and these gigantic growth facilities, you know, it, it's different. It's different than when you're growing six plants at home versus 20,000 plants, um, you know, in, in another, in a much bigger facility. And so as we follow this process along, and we've talked to Pathogen DX now, we've had these tests, we know there's an education factor there that, that happens with the growers that helps them to understand just exactly what's in that facility and where the problems could be or where the hazards actually lie in terms of you know, consumer health and safety, those types of things. But now what? So we know that these that there's these contaminants, we know that there's hazards, we know that there's problems that need to be addressed. So what are the solutions then that can help growers eliminate these contaminants, do some remediation within their grow and ensure that these IPM programs are running just as efficiently as they can? And I, I want to do a quick introduction here, Jim. I know we didn't do this at the beginning, um, but I want to welcome Jim and Ron from Safety Nut back to the show again from our previous podcast. And let's talk about some of these solutions because this is your business. And, and you have been doing this type of work for a long time outside of the cannabis space. And now you've kind of seen where your technology can help cannabis too. So I would love to have you talk about your biosecurity solutions and what are those logical next steps now that we know from Millen's team what problems that there are. Yeah, no, that's, that's great. And, um, you know, uh, I'll, I'll have uh, Jim uh, talk as well here to this point. But once we know where these pathogens are at and, 
And I think testing is a key part of any biosecurity program. And I think it needs to be done, as, as Millen said, on a regular basis. It's not just a one and done, hey, we know where they're at. It's what do you do with that information after that? And I think one of the things that we need to do is we, we need to uh, create policies, procedures, and, and protocols around cleaning and disinfection. Cleaning is one thing, but disinfection is a higher area. So we all need to keep things clean. We need to keep that bio burden down. We need to address different biofilms and things that are on surfaces. Um, but you also need to um, do it on a regular basis. And part of our biosecurity program is, is cleaning, it's disinfecting, it's um, looking at the different areas, as, as Millen has said before, it's air, it's water, it's hard surfaces, um, it's, it's personnel uh, compliance, as we talked about on the, on the first show. So those are all very important areas. And once you identify those areas, then policies and procedures need to be put in place. And, and it can't be a thing where you just do it once you know, or twice, or you start off, every program, right, starts off with a, with a bang. Everybody's really enthused about it, and it starts off, and then all of a sudden, it kind of wanes and dies out. This is something that is a mandatory process that must be done on a regular basis. Um, anything that you find on your, your people in the facility um, on their hands, it's going to be on their devices. It's going to be on the tools that they use. Anything that you see on the surfaces are also, you're going to find them on the people, you're going to find them on the plants. And I think a lot of the testing that was done by Millen and his group, Pathogen DX, um, has, has proved that. So we saw, we saw on the plants, powdery mildew. We also saw on the phone, uh, of one of the uh, folks, powdery mildew. We found on the surfaces and the tables, powdery mildew. So, um, you know, and there's also high touch points. So I'm sure on the light switches, on the faucet handles, on all of those areas, we also are going to find powdery mildew. So we've got to take that information that uh, Pathogen DX has, has found, and we've got to use it to clean and disinfect on a regular basis all of those different areas. Right. And Ron, I think that is another good point as well. And it kind of segues into the fact that you said it's important that you not only clean and disinfect, but do it on a regular basis. Uh, and I think one of the reasons why it's not happening so much today is it does add a lot of steps to the processes that they're already going through in most growth facilities. And the last thing they want is to add additional steps. It's going to take more time and maybe initially even might incur a little bit of extra cost. But what we need to emphasize here is that if it is done and done on a regular basis and done the right way, there will come a point where the you know, contamination and, and so forth will get to a level where not that you're going to stop it, but, you know, it will be under control and be more manageable, you know, and therefore cost may potentially come down and, you know, you may be able to routinely, you know, keep it going uh, without, you know, concern, you know, about all the extra steps and stuff. Yeah, let me add something to what Ron and Jim said, because... I, I appreciate, you know, the support on this because the, 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 the testing that we're offering isn't, isn't expensive. It's not even costly. It's affordable. And because you're, you're able to look for 40 different bugs in a sing, single swab. If you had to do 40 different Petri dishes and the grower is thinking, well, a Petri dish will cost me a buck 50, then you're, you're talking about spending a lot of money and a lot of time and it'll take you five to seven days. These test results can be turned around within 24, 48 hours, and you'll know your answer very quickly that, you know, Safety Net can come in and do their thing with respect to helping remediate these locations. So the, the point around all of this is we don't want the world to think that, oh, you know, a lot of bugs, a lot of dollars. No, it, it, the te technology has been 
we've developed a technology that can help identify. Um, again, I used the, the word in my previous, some of my previous podcasts. Everybody knows what an abacus is, right, to a large degree. And the world of testing was where we, when we were little kids, we'd move one bead from the right to the left on each of the rails. And each, bo- each bead was, if you represent a single bacterial fungal of a bug, would that be one, one at a time testing? And that, that's what's costly. Imagine now the 10 beads on each rails and you're moving them all at the same time. That's how our technology works. We're working, we're looking at many things in the same test at the same time. So it's compressing all the cost to make it affordable for the cannabis industry so that, you know, the, the industry can do this at a very, very, you know, economically reasonable level and get their, their grow, grows clean of these, of these bugs so that safety net can, can then do their, their magic, you know? So. You know, Millen, and to your, to your point is that, that that's, a, that's a real good point. And, and, you know, a lot of people think that, uh, again, that this is an expensive thing when you have to remediate a problem. And if you let it get out of hand, it can be more expensive. But if you keep it up, like we're saying on a regular basis, it's, it's very inexpensive to, um, to clean and to disinfect a, a, a facility. And especially with the technology that's out there now with putting down a disinfectant with an electrostatic sprayer. Well, people may think that it's so expensive and would take so much disinfectant to clean a facility, but we're putting this down in a 30 micron spray that has great coverage and it may only take a gallon of the disinfectant to disinfect or provide an antimicrobial in that entire facility. And the equipment that we're talking about using is not exceptionally expensive equipment. It's, it's really not expensive at all when you, when you take a look at it. So the technology that we have now at our fingertips are making it easier to find out what pathogens are there, but then it's making it easier too to remediate the pathogens. And safety net can either provide all of the equipment, the policies, the procedures, the protocols to to do that, um, you know, or we can do it ourselves. So we make it very inexpensive to do it. And again, I'm just going to go back to, you can't even start this process if you don't know what bugs are in your facility. So without the testing, you know, you're just shooting blindly um, in the dark. And uh, so that is a big piece of our whole biosecurity program is the actual testing itself. So we know what we're dealing with. Fantastic. Thank you so much, you guys, for adding all of this information. Now, one thing I do want to kind of bring up here, though, and, and this is just kind of a question from sort of a consumer's perspective, but as you talk about, these solutions are inexpensive. Um, Regular maintenance keeps costs lower because you're not having to tackle such big issues down the road. Um, Without regulation, I feel like producers, whether it's in the cannabis space or any other space for that, that matter, they're gonna be more concerned about increasing their yields and increasing their profits um, than they are about producing this contaminated product. Regulation helps ensure that everybody kind of has this playing, you know, this level playing field and ensures that everyone is doing this. Do you think that the, that the hesitation um, in, in doing some of these processes, do you think it's just the lack of knowledge and really understanding what these hazards are or how it could impact them down the road? Or is it willful? Is it just them saying, <laughs> Hey, we're we're clean. We wash our hands. It's all good. It, do you do you feel like what what's really causing growers to skip these steps? So 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 you you want to talk about human behavior? That's a tough one, isn't it, Millen? <laughs> um, but uh, you know, let me take a shot at it first, and I'd love to hear from my colleagues here as well. Um, I don't think it's a willful thing. Um, I think that it is education and that if we educate um, not only the public who expects a good quality product, but we educate the growers and the grow facilities, and if they can see 
that by doing what we're saying they should do, they're going to be able to self-regulate rather than having government regulation, which, you know, nobody likes to be over-regulated. And a lot of the government regulation, um, the pendulum swings way too far. And then do you actually have enough people out there to come in and, you know, enforce those regulations? Because that's a problem that we have in healthcare right now. A lot of regulations, but you know what they say? They say, there's nobody really there to enforce the regulation. So I think you need to be, I think we need to educate. I think we need to um, help them self-regulate um, their facilities. And by doing the right thing, and we've talked about this in a, in a podcast uh, that we had before, we can help them produce clean cannabis at a very inexpensive price, and we can increase their yields. But it's having it's 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 having the knowledge to to how to do it right, and and then to help them continue to do it on an ongoing basis. And you make a good point there, Ron. Is that we've talked about you know cost, you know, and the concerns potentially um, that you know some growers may have introducing new testing that may you know have a cost associated to it or you know our processes and our products and and you know all the additional steps time labor all that's cost for sure um and what we're trying to show is that you know if you think about it for a moment you know they're using pesticides all growers use them obviously you know remediation and there's cost in those pesticides you know, and if we look at what we're trying to accomplish, where you take a proactive approach, you test, you find out where your issues you're at, you address those issues head on, um, such that, you know, ultimately, um, you're using, you know, no or fewer, you know, products on the plants themselves. Uh, but, you know, with what we bring to the table, our products um, have the potential to eliminate all of those disinfectants, the pesticides, um, our solutions are green, uh, environmentally safe, non-toxic, you know, completely opposite of the products that are being used today, you know, if you look at them from a scientific standpoint. So if you look at elimination of, say, pesticides and other costly products, even with the introduction of products like ours and the testing that Pathogen brings to the table, I think long term, they will see that the cost actually could come down, um, which will make this far more easy for them to accept, even with the additional steps. Yeah. Let me add a, a couple of things. These are great points that Ron and Jim have made. And I, I do think that um, I do think that at the end of the day, the reason why regulation exists is because to, it goes back to bad behavior bad actors and as a the human behavior and the industry behavior becomes the starting point all of that so if if for example tomorrow the the five of us were were god and we were going to change it from the current legal market regulated market at the state level to a federal market tomorrow the day after tomorrow all the fbi agents will be storming into all these grows Okay. And the pendulum would swish, would swing completely to the on the other side of the, the spectrum. So it goes back to Ron's point and Jim's point is, is that it is it is on us. It is it's it's onerous on us to educate, to to inform, to be the advocacy for this industry, for the key opinion leaders, for the for the like the big multi-state growers to take that leadership opportunity to put these practices in place, because if you're a public company, then what are you saying? You're a public company where you've got a public stock that for your shareholders, you care about the, the profitability, but for, for your shareholders and your consumers, do you care about the safety and the health? And as a medical grade manufacturer of products, what do you care about is the question. And so I, I don't want to get on a soapbox, but the idea behind this whole thing is, Regulation is important, but I believe in balanced, reasonable regulation. I truly do. And I'm, my, my test can do four dozen pathogens, but I'm not, 
I'm not pro- uh, promoting testing four dozen pathogens for regulated testing. It's not a self-serving agenda here. It's what's sensible to do for the consumer, the patients, and the industry, as well as for, for the regulatory bodies, you know, and the industry itself. So that's where my where I come into. There's a balanced approach to achieving this. But we started this industry seven, eight, many, it's many, many years ago. But from a legal perspective, you stand, everybody talked about it's the plant. It's we're doing this because of the plant. So if it's about the plant, then it's not about the dollar as much. Well, dollars are important to keep the doors open. I get that. But the solutions are now very cost effective. They're affordable. They're, they do their job and they, they can help the industry as a whole to clean our, our act up together on this front, you know? Definitely. And, you know, Millen, thank you so much for bringing up the perspective of the investor, because, you know, I think that's going to be the thing that changes first before we see federal legalization or we see kind of federal regulation come down, we're going to see banking changes. And when we see these banking changes happen, you're going to have a wide variety of traditional investors people looking to get involved in the industry. And these are exactly the processes that they're going to be looking to invest in. They are not going to want to invest in companies that are not investing in clean room, clean cannabis production, you know, doing these types of things. So I'm so glad that you brought up that perspective. Absolutely. And thank you for giving me the segue back because the I-280 Act, the I-280 rule basically doesn't allow growers to do it, do uh, deductions on operating expenses. So imagine, you know, Ron and Jim's company and my company has a, uh, you know, we're trying to clean up the industry, but if they do fix that particular thing, then growers are more likely to adopt to these solutions more right away. So, you know, when we talk about a domino, the domino theory in terms of what domino needs to fall first, that's the domino because then guess what happens? All of the behaviors change immediately to say, guess what? I, now I can deduct this expense for safety in this disinfectant solution. I can deduct the expense for pathogen DX testing and boom, everybody falls in line. <laughs> right. 100%. I, I can't agree more. And boy, can't we wait for that day? You know, <laughs> we're so ready to move forward to that next step. Now, Ron, I want to come back to the the project that we have going on and talk about this from your perspective. We heard Millen talk about the different tests that they did and learning just how, what kinds of pathogens were here. So what were those next steps for safety net then? Once we know what's there, what were those uh, yeah, next steps? And, and probably Jim, uh, you can respond to this as, as well. Um, but once we knew where the pathogens were at, then we were able to do targeted disinfection uh, to those areas. So um, to what Millen was saying earlier, we, we found out that they were on some tables, some uh, you know, mobile devices, on the walls, in the uh, HVAC system. So we were then able to select the type of disinfection modality to use and, and then we were able to target it to those areas. Um, so that, that's what really helps us is, is now we, we, we know how to treat and where to treat. And then we can put processes in place to do that treatment on an ongoing uh, basis. Um, so that was, that was real important to us. Um, the the other thing is um you know to um you know when we when we know where to treat we can put certain uh processes in place to track that and to then retest again because like we said before we want to test the first time to find out what we're dealing with and where to treat and how to treat and everything but then we also want to retest on a regular basis to see how effective our treatments are and if we need to increase the, the, um, uh, the number of treatments or not. Um, so that, that's, how, that's how we observed it there. Um, right, and Ron, kind of tying it all together, again, in Mylan's conversation earlier, I mean, he alluded to, you know, from an environmental testing standpoint, uh, testing of hard surfaces, air, water, and so forth, okay? 
And obviously what we did at that growth facility uh, did take all of that into consideration. We did test hard surfaces. We tested water and air and, and all the different you know, um, aspects of what was going on in that environment. Uh, and obviously, you know, what we bring to the table, the products that we you know, offer, you know, hit each and every one of those areas. And again, the hard surface uh, filters in your dehumidifiers, your HVAC, things of that nature, um, you know, touching watering, you know, whether it's tanks, troughs, whatever. Um, so again, what they test for and what and how we can remediate, you know, really do mesh very well together you know and i think that's what makes this such a perfect um, situation that we can identify what needs to be identified and then deal with and remediate you know those very same areas but more effectively i can let me add a couple of things to what ron and jim said here is it's interesting because there's two points that i'd like to make with this with respect to um this process, then this was a great opportunity for us to show how it works, right? Um, one is, is there's a difference between dirty and contaminated. If there's a dirty facility that we, one should not confuse that with contaminated, meaning there's pathogens on there. So in certain cases, we, when you're testing, you can identify the contamination, when you're testing, you don't really identify what's dirty or not in that sample, okay? And th th there's, a important com there's an important distinction here that there's, there's a SOP that needs to be in place for things such as surfaces or walls that over the course of time build up what is called bio burden or biofilms on the walls where the pathogens will have a longer staying power, if you will, if you will. So then it makes, you know, Ron and Jim's job a little bit more difficult if, for example, you know, there isn't there isn't a regular cleaning standard operating procedure versus a um, environmental monitoring or testing standard operating procedure. So the distinction is important in how we get to the clean end state, right? And I mean, the, to it, to a, to a, what I'm saying is, a pathogen-free environment within a growth facility, okay? And there's three different variables. One is the physical infrastructure. So what Jim brought up is air coming into it. How does the HVAC system work? Is there negative air pressure coming out of the building or are you recirculating the same air? So that's what was happening within the results of our, of our cooperation and our partnership on this front is that the air circulation was going in across all the different grow rooms, grow rooms, I think, 11, 12, and 13. So it's perpetuating the, the pathogens that we were finding within, the, within the, 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 these one rooms, and all it was doing is it was spreading across these others. The trimming tools were infected, right? They had uh, powdery mildew, they had total yeast and mold, they had pseudomonas. So this is an example where... Was the trimming tools getting cleaned, right, as, set up, as opposed to getting tested regularly, right? And then once you have that, then anything that's product touching surface, meaning cannabis that you're trimming, is that's product touching. Are you doing the regular, regular monitoring of that specifically? And that, that's what prevents that it from spreading across different places. The second one was... The, the, the human behavior component. And that goes, that goes back into, guess what? Um, I think I did my Clorox job. Sorry, not, I'm just giving an example. But then, you know, then I go and touch the door handle that's got salmonella on it. And then I touch my phone and then I go and touch the trimming tool. You see? So there's, there's aseptic techniques with gloves and booties and, and gowns and a lot, lot of, don't get me wrong. A lot of lot of cultivation facilities have those in practice, but there's 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 another level of practice that goes into it. The third is the mother plant. The mom plant was infected, so if you don't test the mom plant regularly enough, monthly, then guess what happens? It's just per perpetuating across all of the rest of the grow because that's where you start off from square one, and so 
these are the things that are important to what Ron and Jim are doing for their product to be super effective. If something's super dirty and they're saying, well, let's remediate, they're trying to break through not just the, the dirt, but to the pathogen. It's more difficult. Most definitely. And, you know, I, I from my perspective, at least, and, and I kind of consider myself a layman. I'm a journalist. I'm not a grower. I don't have a facility. Um, but at least from my perspective, I feel like after talking to both of you, that this really is a process. There are steps that need to be taken. Like you said, if you're not cleaning on a regular basis, then it's going to be more difficult to remediate some of these pathogens down the way. If you're not having your staff come in and maybe change clothes or at least put on smocks and booties and, and hair nets and things to help hold in some of um, the, the things that they might be carrying on them. Uh, I know that I had, I had one of the facilities that I toured early on as a, as a journalist, they, it was one of the first ones that I'd ever been through that had asked me to smock up and put booties on before we went into the grow room. And I was so impressed with that because they knew, you know, especially here in Colorado, and, and there's a lot of other states that allow this, but a lot of people grow at home. And so if they're growing at home and they have pests or they have things that are happening on their own plants and then they come into work and you're not asking them to change their clothes or to put on, you know, some protective gear, whatever pests that they're, they're growing at home or whatever contaminants that they may have there, they're just going to carry into the commercial facility. And then you're going to have all these problems perpetuate from that. And so I, I love the fact that you talk about SOPs and having these standard operating procedures that help protect the grow facilities from contamination and from hazards. And, and then, you know, work with companies like Ron and Jim and safety net to help, eliminate those problems on on a regular basis so then they don't become a bigger problem down the road and you know i i'm i'm just really anxious and and excited to follow this project through see how things are are progressing and just see how much the partnership between pathogen dx and safety net really helps to ensure that these facilities are doing all that they can to produce a good clean crop and one last comment real quick, because I know we're getting close to our time here, but, um, you know, we've heard the word education multiple times. Mylon mentioned it, Ron's mentioned it, you've mentioned it. It is all about educating them. Uh, and I think that's what's going to have to happen because, you know, everybody's used to doing things one way, the same way. It has worked in the past, you know, we're going to continue to do it. And here we are trying to bring new processes, new products and, and so forth you know, new technology to bear that we know will significantly improve the overall cannabis market. Uh, but we also need to educate people on the products, what they can do, you know, the fact that they, you know, are non-toxic and so forth, as opposed to the pesticides or the new testing method, okay? The science behind them, which you know, is what Mylan's all about and so forth we do need the education and the education will then help people to accept everything that we're bringing to the table far better. Absolutely. And thanks so much for bringing that up, Jim. And that's what we try to do here at Cannabis Tech is help with those education initiatives. Not only do we want to educate the consumer about the end product that they are consuming, but obviously we need to educate growers as we learn ourselves. Some of this science is new to everyone, you know? So these are, these are things that everyone is kind of adjusting to and learning. I think the pandemic kind of opened up our eyes a little bit maybe to some of the pathogens and, and hazards that are floating in the air and on surfaces and things like that. So I really do feel like this kind of technology, these kinds of solutions and standard operating procedures are just gonna be, um, you know, one of those core values within the cannabis space as we continue to go forward. And, you know, guys, I cannot thank you enough for taking the time out of your day to day to come on and talk about this stuff for that reason. We want to have those experts, have you experts on the show to talk about the things that you're seeing. And this is these kinds of conversations are what really is going to help educate everyone as we continue to watch this industry evolve. Now we have a third podcast coming up and I wanna to touch base on that real quick for our listeners out there. We're gonna do a final follow-up and we're gonna talk more about the, the testing that Millen has done, the remediation and decontamination that SafetyNet has done, and then 
the follow-up tests. We're going to go back and take a look and see just how well these contamination or decontamination efforts have worked. And so, guys, again, I am so excited that you have agreed to this project and that you're coming onto the show and talking about these things. And we're looking forward to the final results of this clean cannabis project we have going on.